So over the last couple of weeks, I'm going to pick up where we left off. Um, the title of the message, for those who don't know, and today I will finish it up, it's called, What Would You Give Up For It? And we talked about evaluation, and that's really where I want to start today. I want to, I want to start with the picture, which is basically the picture, uh, I'll describe it for those who may be listening and can't see. It's a picture of a man that is sitting across the table from his boss, and he is readily listening to his boss and the evaluation that's coming forth from his boss towards him. Now, there's a couple of things to consider when we're talking about evaluation. Today, before you came to service, you evaluated what you were going to wear. You looked outside. I'm sure with all the rain that we've been getting lately, you considered, should I bring an umbrella? Should I not? You can consider then after that, is it 50 degrees, 60 degrees, 70 degrees, or 80 degrees? All these things come into play when you start considering what, where, what you're going to wear, how you're going to wear it, what accessories you're going to take with you, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. These are all process of an evaluation. Now, why do I say that? I say that because you're evaluating it based on a prior experience, what you went through before with that certain subject. So, for example, this week when I went running, I had to wear a waterproof jacket on because I knew it was raining. Why? Because I know if I go outside and I don't wear something waterproof and it's raining, I'm going to be completely drenched and then I may get sick. So my evaluation was made based on the premise that in a prior occasion, I had the opportunity of getting wet, and I ended up getting worse than prior to me getting wet. So I took precautions. The same thing applies here when you're looking at this picture of this man and his boss. The boss is making an evaluation. He is laying out a term. He's laying out a standard on his employee telling him, you need to do X, Y, and Z. You've been doing W, X, and Y great, but you need to start working on X, Y, and Z. So if you look at that, then you take into consideration, this is not Pastor Delio, God bless you all. (laughs) He's got to look at the picture. (laughs) I love the man. (laughs) But then you, you take into consideration, I had to break the ice a little bit because you guys were too serious for Friday night. Then you take into consideration every aspect of everything that you're going on in life and you have a rating system. Every one of us, whether we know it or not, has a rating system. Every one of us, I can put before you right now a certain type of dessert. And some of you will say, I love that chocolate cake. Or some of you will say, I love that flan. Some of you may love one more than the other. Why? Because you've experience the flavor of it, it's taste your palate, your your palate has tasted it, and now you put it into a category. You say, anytime that la hermanita Maria Elena cooks ceviche, I want to eat that ceviche. And then you want the white rice that goes with it. Why? Because you evaluated that combination. You said, it tastes really, really good. So in our life, we have this little man somewhere inside of us, and he's running around with so many different charts in our life that say, this is excellent, this is average, this is very good, and these things are below average. Some of the things go so far below that we say, these are the things that I don't want to touch, I don't want to coexist with, I don't want to interact with. And that's okay. It's all part of the valuation that we have to make in life with different things. What I want to do today, more than anything, is educate you on how to make an appropriate evaluation. One thing is to motivate you. Another thing is to educate you. The church of God today is very motivated, and that's great. But there is no point in motivating people if you're not going to educate them to live for themselves. Because a person that is dependent upon one leader, one pastor, one apostle, one deacon, one whatever, is going to be dependent on that person their entire life. And the day that that person has a fall, and we all do, then all of a sudden, the person that was following that being is going to fall apart because they had no substance. God has not called us to be people that are wishy-washy. Since the beginning, God wanted... For his people to seek him directly. If you go back to the book of Exodus, you'll notice, and I I won't take you there today, but you'll notice how when everything started with, with Moses, Moses had every intention of going up the mountain with the entire people of Israel. But the people of Israel said, wait a second, Moses, there's something that's different up there. We are afraid to go into that place. You go for us and you let us know what happens. Now, I don't know about you guys, but I don't like hearing the news. The reason I don't like hearing the news is because I like to be involved in the news. 
I like to be in the nitty gritty. I like to be in the front lines. I like to know what's going on. I like to be um, prepared for something way before. I like to be in the cusp of everything that's going on. Some people don't. Some people say, it doesn't interest me. Like, to be honest with you, every so often I have a little cheese man. I tell my wife, baby, you want to hit a new one? And she goes, mm, just tell me. And I'm like, no, 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 but guess. She goes, just tell me. And I'm like, come on, guess. And she goes, I don't care. And I'm like, but I do. I want you to guess. I mean, it's silly things like that. I'm just, I'm just, I'm, that's how I am. I'm, I'm like that. I'm, I'm engaged like that. I'm curious like that. And, and my curiosity at times will, will push me to want to be that Moses. Maybe I'm realizing today why I am where I am. Because God said, I'm going to use your curiosity, Joel, to be on the front line. Sometimes being on the front line is great because you get all the perks. And sometimes being on the front line is hard because you get the first attacks. You know, my wife was saying something very curious today, and I don't know if she's realized it or not. She's been making this prayer for the women of the church, and, and for that matter, the church in itself, about God opening up the womb of these women. Amen? What I don't think that my wife realized, or maybe she did it, we just haven't talked enough about the topic, is that what I think God is really doing is releasing the womb of the church in itself. In other words, that this church finally be able to start giving birth to the, to the growth, to the increase that God has called for us. You see, there's something wrong. And, and as a pastor, we also have to evaluate things. There's something wrong when there's no growth. That means that intimacy has stopped. That means that there's no procreation going on. And you have to ask yourself, what is going on? I'll give it to you like this. In my process of evaluating things, you have to look at every variable in the equation. For example, if you ask yourself as a pastor, why is the church not developing? You have to understand one thing. The church cannot develop from the growth of one pastor. Pastors form leaders. Sheep, as you're called when you're part of a church, beget sheep. In other words, sheep come with sheep and eventually create more sheep. So there's some kind of disconnect between the sheep. And the question that you have to evaluate is, what's going on between the sheep? Are the sheep distracted? Even right now as we talk, are you looking at your phone and checking your Facebook status? Are you looking on your phone and checking to see who put what on Instagram? This is the problem in the church today. Technology has sucked us into this vortex where we have so many distractions, so many things we're thinking about that we have to do. Email is the biggest culprit. I almost wish that email didn't exist anymore. I remember the days when I used to leave work at 5 o'clock on a Friday and I didn't have to worry about work until 8.30 on Monday. Now work never ends. Technology, as great as it is, has absorbed us into a society where we have the attention span of a cockroach. Literally. Everybody says it's ADD. It's not ADD. You're just distracted by so many things that are going on. We're in church. We're worshiping God. And we're thinking about, what am I going to have for lunch? What am I going to go out to church? What am I going to see so-and-so? I wonder if sister so-and-so is coming today. And these are things that I have to consider when I evaluate the development of this church. How can I reach someone that doesn't want to be reached? It's like when the, the phone company calls my house and my, my TV shows me who's calling and I see somebody in Malibu Bay, immediately I say, I don't want to answer that call. I remember in New York it was CSE Holdings, which means it was my whole company trying to get me back to use their cable. And I said, I'm not going to answer that call. I'm not going to answer that call. And I think what's happening is that God is sending his prophets, sending his leaders. He is standing at the rooftops. He is standing from the top of the mountain, screaming down to his people. And we're saying, Lord, I know you're calling me, but right now I have something that's more important than you. And we're all saying, no, Pastor, I will never do that. But our actions speak a lot louder than our words. Our actions, what do you mean, Pastor? What I mean is that... We, we come to church and worship, and, and look, guys, this is not a whooping session. This is just a re this is reality. You know, I'm talking about evaluating it, and we have to ask ourselves, why? You know, you can't have this 800-pound gorilla standing in a corner and say, what's going on? Why is this not happening? You know, I, I, I've had instances where there's been couples that can't get pregnant, and they wonder why, and then you ask them the silly question, and you say, that, well, well, have you consummated your desire? And it's like, oh. It ain't happening through the stall. Sorry. And, and I know we laugh, and we laugh at a couple that you're really looking at, and you say, come on, man, you, you want to have a kid, you've got to be intimate. 
But doesn't the same result happen in the church when we enter into intimacy with God? Why are we married? Why are we going through moments of difficulty? Why as individuals, are we, why are we having trouble as individuals? Why are we having troubles as a church? Now I'm not saying that everything in life is bad. Don't misunderstand me. What I'm saying is that we have to get to the point where we start facing our issue. We start making some serious evaluations. If this church was your business, now let me get into something physical, something tangible. If this church was your actual business, and it wasn't producing the financial income that you needed to continue the business, would you be worried? Absolutely. Pastor Robert has a business that's real estate. If his real estate business was not producing a financial income, would he be worried? Of course. Why? Because it leads from your business not producing a financial increase to now your children not having enough food to eat. What happens is we become so reliant on the grace of God that we forget our part in this equation. We forget that we're actually liable for something when it comes to church, when it comes to the kingdom. I love what, what Miss Melissa, I was about to call you Pastor Melissa, what Miss Melissa said during the, the, the announcements when she said, it's not about the church, it's about the kingdom. She's 100% right. How many of us really have that kingdom mentality? How many of us are really saying, I want to, Or how many of us are really thinking in our mind, I just want people to come to new beginnings? Because it's not about new beginnings. You see, new beginnings is an afterthought. It's an add-on. God will provide those who need to be here. But we have to have the right mentality. We have to have, we have to evaluate ourselves and ask ourselves, Joel, are you doing this for the right reason? Joel, are you investing yourself for the right reason? Or are you investing yourself because you want to see X, Y, and Z? And God is talking about A, B, and C. And as you sit there, it's, it's important to understand that this is not about Joel. This is not about Daniel. This is not about Elizabeth. This is not about Robert. This is not about Maria. This is not about any of the pastors. This is about you. Tell the person next to you, it's about you. Point at them and tell them, it's about you. The reason I want you to point at them is because I want them to understand clearly, concisely, that they are responsible for kingdom growth. Tell the person next to you, have you made the kingdom grow? The process of evaluation is fourfold. Number one, when we evaluate something, I'll ask you, do you consider the outer characteristics? In the Bible, in the first book of Samuel, 17, 4, 11, and I'll read it for you. And a champion went out to the camp of the Philistines named Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits in a span, almost ten foot tall. And he had a bronze helmet on his head and wore a coat of mail, and the coat weighed 5,000 shekels of bronze. He says, it had bronze shine armor on his legs and bronze javelin across his shoulders and the shaft of his spear was like a weaver's beam. His spear's head weighed 600 shekels of iron and a shield bearer went before him. Goliath stood and shouted to the ranks of Israel, have you come out to draw up for battle? Am I not a Philistine and are you not servants of Saul? Choose a man for yourselves and let him come down to me. If he is able to fight with me and kill me, then we will be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then you shall be our servants and serve us. And the Philistine said, I defy the ranks of Israel this day. Give me a man that, he may, that we may fight together. When Saul and all Israel heard those words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. So here you have this man, this, this Philistine, that basically was, was, from the outer perspective of things, he was an enormous, enormous adversary. A lot of us currently in our life evaluate certain decisions such as following Christ because we look at these enormous Goliaths in our life and we say, I can't really deal with this Goliath, so I'd rather not try at all. Has that ever happened to you? Have you ever gotten into counseling with your wife or your husband? And have you ever yes the counselor just because you just didn't want to deal with the 800-pound gorilla in the room anymore? And you said, I'd rather not touch that subject. I'd rather not deal with that subject. I, I just don't want to go there. Has that ever happened? And then you brush it away, and three months later, guess what came back out? 
the 800 pound gorilla. And then you brush it away again, and three months later it comes back out. And guess what it is? That same 800 pound gorilla. And then six months later, now he's got another 800 pound gorilla with someone else because you kept brushing that 800 pound gorilla away into the point where it started gaining weight and it overtook your marriage. We evaluate this 800 pound gorilla by the weight that it represents. And we don't realize that the God that we serve is much grander than that 800-pound gorilla. Will it hurt to evict that 800-pound gorilla from your house? Yes, it will. Is it impossible? No, it's not. If you read and you continue to read in verse 45 to 47 right there in that chapter, and I'm not going to read everything for you tonight, but I do want to read certain, certain verses for you. 45 to 47, it says, Then said David to the Philistine, You come to me with a sword and a spear and a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the ranks of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hand, and I will smite you and cut off your head, and I will give the corpses of the army of the Philistines this day to the birds of the air and the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth, what kind of earth? Come on, say it like you mean it. All the earth, what shall it do? It says that all the earth, come on, may know that there is a God in Israel. And all this assembly shall know that the Lord saves not with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. Look how phenomenal it is to know that we serve the God that can destroy the biggest, most, most, most potent enemy there is out there. In our process of evaluation, we have to consider the outer characteristics, but we have to always consider the outer characteristics of our Lord before those of the enemy. We tend to focus only on the enemy, and we put out of the picture God. And God is trying to say, just let me creep in. Just let me show my face. Just let me be in the center of your life. Just let me be a little bit of what you need me to be. And when we're able to do that, then we can make a true evaluation. Can I get an amen? The second point to evaluating something. Do we look at past history? In Acts chapter 9, verse 11 to 16, and you could look that up if you like, it says, And the Lord said to him, Get up and go to the street called Straight, and ask the house of, and ask, at the house of Judas for a man of Tarsus named Saul. For behold, he is praying there. And he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias, obviously, he's, obviously God is talking Ananias here, enter and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard many people tell about this man, especially how much evil and what great suffering he has brought on your saints at Jerusalem. Now he is here and has the authority from the high priest to put in chains all who call upon your name. But the Lord said to him, Go, for this man is a chosen instrument of mine to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the descendants of Israel. Now, I make a, a, a purpose of stopping here in this story because it's important that we realize that, yes, Saul had a past history. Yes, Saul was a person that was used by the enemy to destroy the people of God. Yes, Saul persecuted the church. Yes, Saul did all these bad things, but... Saul repented. Saul had an encounter. When we evaluate something, when we evaluate the word of someone, we can't allow ourselves to become judge, jury, and executioner. We can't allow ourselves to get to the point where we look upon somebody and we don't give somebody the opportunity. And I'm going to tell you why. Because today God is still extending his opportunity to you and to me. During our process of evaluation, we have to consider things. I'm not saying for us to be doormats for everybody. What I'm saying is that we have to consider certain things. We have to consider the investment of time and energy into certain things. But we also have to consider grace and the grace of God. Now, you may say, but pastor, how do I know if someone has truly converted or they haven't converted? Well, I'll tell it to you like this. You have to look at their fruits. The Word of God says that by their fruits they shall be known. By their fruits. You have to look at their lifestyle. You have to look at who they are. You have to look at who they hang out with. Why? 1 Corinthians 15.33. Bad company corrupts good character. If you see somebody hanging out with drug addicts, it's 99.9% true that they're drug addicts. They're not just trying to evangelize them. Now, I'm not trying to knock anybody. 
You know, because the truth is God can do some miraculous stuff. But at the same rate, you and I have to protect ourselves from being hurt. That's, process, that's part of the process of evaluation. We can't allow ourselves to be dragged in the mud. We can't allow ourselves to, to let someone, no matter how close they are to us, no matter how much we may love them in the flesh, we can't allow them to bring us under simply because they may be kin to us. How many say amen? The third point, now we talked about first and foremost looking at the outer characteristics. Secondly, we talked about looking at past history. And third, we're now going to talk about do we look at their current circumstances? Let's open up the Bible in Matthew chapter 15, verse 32 to 34. The Bible says, Then Jesus called his disciples to him and said, I have pity and sympathy, and I am deeply moved for the crowd, because they have been with me now three days, and they have had nothing at all left to eat. And I am not, I am not willing to send them away hungry, lest they faint or become exhausted on the way. And the disciples said to him, Where are we to get bread sufficient to feed so great a crowd in this isolated and desert place? And Jesus asked him, how many loaves of bread do you have? They replied, seven and a few small fish. So here we are, their current situation. The evaluation of the disciples was simply to take God out of the equation. They forgot for a moment that they were walking with Jesus Christ. They forgot for a moment that they were walking with a man that they saw lift people from the dead. They saw make the blind see. They saw make the lame walk. They saw make the deaf hear. I mean, can you imagine that for a second? Can you imagine if you physically walked with Jesus Christ and he did all these things right by you? And in the moment when someone's hungry, you would doubt that he can find a way to provide? I mean, if you look at Scripture and you read the story and, and how he said, go cast your, your, your fishing rod into the sea. And when he brought that fish up, he said, open the mouth of that fish. And when they opened the f- fish's mouth, there was a coin in there. I mean... Jesus had a track record like no one else, didn't he? Does he not today? So the reason I I bring you to this point where I ask you, does he not today, is because so many of us grow concerned about things that Jesus can do just like this. I mean, or tell me this, is your sickness so much worse than death itself? Is your financial situation so much worse than God being able to motivate a couple of men with a couple of fish and a couple of pieces of bread to actually provide for thousands and thousands of people? Is your marriage so bad that a man that can make someone live from the dead can resurrect love in your marriage? These are things that we have to consider in our process of evaluation. We have to consider when we're looking at our life for what it is and our life for where we want to get to and then say, how do I go from this spot to this spot? You have to include Jesus. You see, Jesus is the bridge that takes you from bad to good. Jesus is the bridge that takes you from okay to great. Jesus is the bridge that takes you from good to so much better. How many say amen? Amen. Do you believe it? Do you, believe, do you believe it enough to stand up right now and say, God, I am dealing with this in my life, but I believe today, I am including you in my evaluation today, and I believe that today, right now on this, the 29th of January of 2016, I vow that I will trust you in X, Y, and Z, and I believe that you'll do it. That's something that we each have to, we have to make a mental note and ask ourselves, do I really want to do it? The last point, do we evaluate based on our emotions? In 1 Kings 19, 1 to 4, and I'm almost wrapping up here, last point, it talks about this man Elijah and how Elijah ran from Jezebel after killing 850 men. But it goes so far as saying, and this is out of the Amplified, it says that, that Elijah ran a distance of 80 miles in one day. In a car, I get it. With sandals, hairy, with a rug on you, I don't get it. In the desert, I don't get it. You just killed, hold on, you just killed, let me get this straight, hold on. You just killed 850 men. I can't understand the amount of tiredness that Elijah had. Let's start there. 850 men, I don't care if they were pansies, okay? You, I mean, it takes a lot to kill a man. He killed 850 men. I can't imagine the amount of blood he had on him, the amount of guts he had on him, the amount of flesh he had on him, the pieces of bodies that were all around him, the amount of grime that this man had on him. He killed all these men. And in the same day that he did that, one woman stands up and says, by the end of this day, in 24 hours, I will kill you. 
This man got up and boogied. He ran. He ran and ran and ran. And then, well, wait, it gets better. So one thing is you running from an adversary. Another thing is you running from an adversary, dropping down in depression because there's no other way to call it, and then asking God, the provider of life, to take your life away. Now, look at all the different things that are messed up in that picture. Number one, you run from one woman after you killed 850 men. Number two, you run at the speed of lightning, let's call it. Number three, you get to the point where you get to a tree, and instead of sitting there and, and rethinking, he sits there and he says, if only I can die because one woman is seeking you. You just killed all the representatives of her gods. Her gods. Those, that means the ones above her. And you're afraid of the one below? Are many of us today currently afraid of something smaller than what we have already defeated? We're afraid of the minions when we defeated the big guy? It's crazy because I can guarantee you that most of you, if Satan showed up to your house with a pitchfork and dressed in red with horns on his head, you'd be like, in the name of Jesus, with your best Christian accent. But if a blonde bombshell walked into your house tempting you to fornicate, you'd be like, I can't do it. I'm going to fold. We fold for the small things. But we want to battle with the big things. Here is Elijah. After running 80 miles, I still don't know how he did it. I can't run a mile. This man ran 80 miles after killing all these men, drops underneath the broom tree, the Bible says. He asked God to take his life, which clearly shows he had no idea of who God really was, even after that great victory. But how many of us aren't in the same position today? And then he sits there and he says, God, take my life. He falls into a deep sleep and he still says, Lord, I don't want to do this. So you know what God did in that moment? Because Elijah could not evaluate correctly in that moment, God created a way for the work that Elijah was predestined to do to be done by other men. Jehu, Elisha, and another man of God that Scripture talks about in 1 Corinthians 19. He says, this one will do this, this one will do that. Elisha was the one that was predestined to get rid of Jezebel, but Jehu had to come into picture to finish the job. Elisha was the one that was supposed to continue being a prophet, but Elisha had to be lifted up because Elijah gave up. Are you currently underneath that broom tree? Thank you for joining the NBMI experience today. Like, comment, and subscribe at www.facebook.com front slash NBMINY or our YouTube channel at www.youtube.com front slash NBMICHURCH. Also check out our new and improved website at www.newbeginningschurches.com. And finally, check out our new awesome church app, available on both Android and Apple platforms. Search your app store for NBMICHURCH and be blessed.